Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Modern Music Marketing Podcast. In this episode, I get to talk to Ashley K. Stoyanov, who has worked at PR companies, record labels, she did some help with MTV back in the day, and she's the founder of an organization called Woman Crush Music, who helps women kind of get like business and music industry support through showcases and just general advice. But anyway, she has a ton of experience, we talk about a ton of stuff in this pretty long episode, so hope you enjoy. Awkward <laughs> potato. Nah, go for it. <laughs> anyway, hi, I'm Awkward Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> founder of Woman Crush Music. Uh, we are a nonprofit arts organization that uh, our mission is to create opportunities for rising women songwriters through community. Uh, I founded the organization about three years ago, truly by accident. Um, I had just moved to Portland, Oregon from New York City, where I was born and raised, and I didn't know anyone. And um, I was really actively performing and writing songs at the time, and I really didn't know how to break into the music scene there. There was so much talent in Portland, still is, um, <laughs> one of the most talented cities I think I've ever lived. Um, but not enough industry, it's different now. It's definitely different now, but at the time, five years ago, um, it wasn't, uh, the music scene wasn't as blossoming as it is now. So I naturally, because I'm a connector of people and connector to people, I decided to start curating showcases at a local venue, uh, very small venue, shout out to the Gate Lounge, hope you're still around. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we, after three months of curating these women songwriter showcases, we were packing the place, local media started showing up. Um, all these great things started happening and I wanted to do more. I was just like, how, how else can I help these women who are now my friends? Like, I just, I want to do more for them. And instead of getting advice, when I reached out to some of my music networks, I started getting a lot of, can you bring this here? Can you bring this here? Can you bring this mm. here? And I was just like, okay, I think I'm onto something. Like I saw a need, yeah. clearly other people have this need too. And for a year, um, you know, I was kind of doing this by myself, creating showcases virtually, um, connecting with other people online to host showcases in their city. And at one point I was running uh, Portland showcases, New York showcases, Nashville showcases, and Vancouver, BC showcases all by myself. <laughs> Um, and oh, I was geez. just like, I, <laughs> I'm going crazy. And at that point, someone in New York reached out to me and they were like, Hey, do you need help? And I was like, you know what? Yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> and from Hell that yes. point on, <laughs> yes, I was like, yes, I need a lot of help. <laughs> um, but from that point on, um, my team of one became a team of 30 volunteers across wow. North America in like a year. And at that point, we, we weren't anything. You know, I didn't know if we were promoters or a startup or, you know, we weren't charging for anything. We weren't making any money. It was purely we wanted to create these opportunities. So that's when I decided I wanted to go the nonprofit route because I never wanted artists have to have to pay for anything or if they did for it to be a very affordable thing. Yeah. Um, or like by, by donations. And so that's really what sparked everything. And now here we are three years later and we've done some amazing things. And actually today we announced that we are launching a virtual tour starting in August. So I'm nice. pretty pumped about that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good timing considering you can't really do a regular tour now. And so it's, it's kind of like your, your main thing started with these showcases, which you can't do at all. So it's it's good that you found a way to fill that gap. Yeah, well, I mean, when, when COVID hit, obviously we were, as many other people were, forced to pivot our programming and we did that um, and it was pretty successful. We were having weekly Instagram live showcases. We had some really cool webinars with uh, CD Baby, Song Trust, really focusing on, on money making or keeping track of money for songwriters because that's what yeah. everyone's, of course, panicking about right now. <laughs> they can't perform live. So we really wanted to fill those needs as best as we could. Um, and they were going really well. The engagement was great. But, you know, over the years, we became known for this uh, local chapter feel. And I felt like when we went virtual, that wasn't really translating. Um, and I really wanted to find a way to kind of bridge that gap and also be able to support the local venues who have been supporting us all of these years. Yeah. 
And so what we ended up deciding on is that starting in August, we will be virtually visiting a new city or area um, every two weeks. And so we will partner with a local venue to put on these showcases to spotlight local talent. The venues will get 100% of the ticket sales. We're partnering with wow. sponsors to uh, pay the artists. Um, and we will be doing that throughout the rest of the year. So the tour is going to be like a five month long tour. <laughs> Jeez, that's, <laughs> and we're, that's intense. Yeah. Like, like, so you're uh, as a nonprofit. So you're, you're giving the venues all these ticket sales. Are, are you a hundred percent donation based? Yeah. Yes, we are 100% volunteer run. Um, wow. we, kind of up until now we've just been getting by with some monthly donations and local sponsors to run our programming um to full disclosure 2020 was going to be the year we were pitching everybody and their mom our sponsorship deck and we did but then COVID hit and they were like actually um well we just had to let go of our entire staff so no money for you <laughs> which yeah. i mean how can you how can you get around that you can't um, so right. I, I've heard that from a the, lot of artists. They're like, 2020 yeah. was going to be my biggest year ever. I had the most shows booked. It was going to be the year I could finally go full time or whatever. And then all of a sudden just boo, nothing. Yeah. I mean, That's... the way I think of it is we have been able to do so much as an organization with very little funding and we can continue to do that. Um, but I just think the possibilities are definitely endless once we do get some some major support. Um, yeah. So yeah. we are we are hopeful that we can get some uh, more funding for this tour so that we can be able to pay the artists more and put a little into the promotion of it all um, to make it super successful and really help support the local scenes. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's that's what we've got going on. Damn. So. Uh, Woman Crush is essentially like, it, it sounds to me at least, it's you're essentially a PR company mixed with like a, a whole bunch of other things in one, except as a nonprofit. <laughs> and the thing that's cool about, about your past, when I, when I was looking up your bio on your, on your website, I think it was, is that you worked at like PR companies, you've you know, worked like record labels, you worked at essentially every type of music industry business there is. <laughs> Um, at some point. So um, I think it'd be cool to like dive into kind of like what get you started down that path and then like how over the years, how did you bounce between all these different like unique niches in the music business industry? Yeah, um, for sure. So I probably started as a lot of people watching this channel as I was writing a lot of songs, performing a lot of shows. I went through like three or four different bands. And then I went solo because everyone kept saying I was a diva. I don't see it. <laughs> <laughs> um, they did say that about me. I don't see it. Um, anyway, but, so I went solo. Um, and then when I moved to Portland, I still um, was solo and performing a lot then. But then I got a lot more into co-writing. Um, but while I was performing in all these bands and you know, growing up in the New York music scene was something else. I, I've got, I've got stories. Um, but, you know, I, I've always had this interest in writing. I've always known that I was a strong writer. I know that I was a strong uh, communicator. And so my, my parents were very supportive of my music career, but I think they also kind of lightly encouraged that I did not major in music. Mm. <laughs> so I did not. And I'm actually very thankful for that because I ended up majoring in PR and marketing. Ooh. And I figured that was a, probably a good route to go because if I wanted to be famous, I should probably figure out a way to do that <laughs> for myself. Yeah. And that was before I even knew how the industry worked now. Um, and so when I decided that, I started interning. Uh, my first internship was in PR at Atlantic Records. Um, that was a really, really cool experience. I got to work with some really cool people at the label, um, a lot of cool artist campaigns. I was around when Icona Pop started blowing up. Um, and uh, I worked on like some of like Wiz Khalifa's like campaigns and it was, it was a little wild. Yeah. <laughs> it was wild. And then I, and then after that, I ended up at um, MTV and I worked on 
worked with uh, Snooki and JWoww for a while, <laughs> and that was an interesting experience. It's um, Snooki, like that. from the like Jersey, from Jersey Shore. Shore. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Yep, I worked one of their press parties. It's sweet, sweet girls, honestly. They are, they are very nice people. Um, and I then head over to BMG, um, and I learned a bunch about public publishing. I was the A and R and creative uh, intern, basically assistant, um, and I learned a lot about how sync placements work there. Um, so a little bit of everything. Um, but I I kind of knew that my heart was in was in PR um like always um and so i was doing a little bit of that once i got out of school um just like freelance helping my friends pitch their stuff and pitching my own stuff yeah. um and i realized i had a knack for it um and I, at the time in college i also ended up working at uh the iridium jazz club in times square <laughs> which was an amazing experience i got to meet so many guitar legends and jazz legends like best probably best job worst paid best job <laughs> <I've> ever <had. laughs> um and yeah it's just it's the music the music world in New York was definitely a journey. Um, but once I moved to Portland, you know, I, I ended up not working in the music industry while still building Woman Crush. Um, and it actually taught me a lot uh, working in other industries that I could still apply to building up the organization. So I, I ended up on the community marketing team for Yelp. Um, and that was mm. really great because I learned a lot about how to get partnerships um, and social media stuff. And then I ended up managing co-working spaces in New York and managing online virtual communities and building up membership platforms for different startups, which is what I do now. Um, and it's been, it's been great. <laughs> that's, that's nuts. Cause you, you don't, you look pretty young and you've done all of that. Which is like that's, that's I'm 28. A, I'm not that young. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm also 28, and like that's an insane list of um, of accolades to collect by the time you're 28. Because we think like you finish school at 23, 24, depending on how long it takes. But like that's that's a lot of stuff in in only a couple of years. You you start young, and I mean I I started working I guess in the industry when I was 19, so that's almost okay. 10 years. Wow. Jeez. Yeah. Um, so I'm like mind blown at how uh, all the little things you've done along the way. I mean, not all the little things, all the big things you've done along the way. So um, one thing like is you, you got into doing PR and marketing in, in college and like obviously all the all the jobs you did along the way or I guess like careers you did along the way. Um, what's been the thing that's kind of like what's been the thing that surprised you the most about what actually works for marketing music versus what you thought it was when you were just, you know, the, the in aspiring musician back when you were 19. Is there anything that like really stands out to you? I think back when I was just starting out, I didn't actually realize how much competition was out there. And that when you are pitching a press person, you can't just be like, hi, I'm Ashley, a singer songwriter from New York city that does pop. Because yeah. guess what? Everyone else <laughs> is also a singer songwriter from New York City that does pop. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. that that first line is not gonna hook them. I can promise you that. <laughs> that's that's probably and, the most common thing I see people saying how to start their messaging too. It's like, you know, hey, I'm I'm Andrew from Massachusetts and I'm an electronic music producer and vocalist. It's like, well, how many other electronic music producers and vocalists are there? Like what I've heard is that it's good to get way more specific and kind of like tell your story. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. Um, and I think that the hardest part about that is some some artists don't know what exactly their story is. They're, or they'll be like, oh, well, I don't have a story. I just do music. Okay. Why do you do music? what kind of music do you do? Why are you compelled to write that kind of music? You know, well, you do, everyone has a story. Everyone has a story. Yeah. Um, and that, that's kind of why you, if you need help, you can work with a PR person to, to help you 
develop that. Um, but everyone has a story. Everyone. Yeah, I, I agree. And it's. I, I also would say that it's definitely hard for an artist to figure it out for themselves. Like, I, I struggle with it even still. Like, when, when people ask me to, like, send them, like, a, a bio or press release, I'm kind of like, I freeze for a second, even though, like, I have some stuff ready. It's like, I'm always like, is this what I want? And it's it's hard to talk about your yourself and kind of tell your own story when you're you're living it you know <laughs> i i'm going to leave you and your uh followers with this ask yourself what value are you providing for whoever you're pitching whether it's a press uh you know for a press feature a booking uh whatever it is what value are you providing that's a good point. It's almost like you watched my um, my last two podcasts because <laughs> we we spent <laughs> we spent like twenty minutes in each of them talking with um, the the core idea of like providing value anytime you reach out to someone, um, and in particular like when you're reaching out to collaborate with another artist or maybe get a good feature or dual release opportunity, instead of reaching out and being like collab bro, which was the title of the video I uploaded yesterday um, um Love that. <laughs> yeah and, and instead of doing that like hey collab do something like hey i i know you're you're a producer i love your music i know you have like ten thousand monthly listeners and even though my audience is smaller i noticed that you mentioned the instagram you're always like looking for vocalists and looking to hire a vocalist well i'm a great vocalist and and here's some samples but i'll sing in your album or i'll sing in your song for free if we can do it as a dual release or you know pitch them some kind of value or maybe you're the bigger artist and you want someone's talent or maybe you're bigger on instagram and they're bigger on spotify and you can kind of leverage all these value value propositions um but how would you approach doing that when it comes to um i guess more traditional pr like hitting up a, a blog or something gotta hit them with something that's relevant okay um and if for some reason what you're putting out is not relevant, find a way to make it relevant. Like, yeah. find a way. Um, let me try to think of an example. Okay, going to give you um, an example of an artist that I know, she's from Portland, Oregon. Um, I think what she did was a great PR move. Um, so obviously when COVID hit, I think a lot of us musicians were like struggling to figure out what to do. I, maybe we still are <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in terms of like, can we release music? How do we release music? We can do a lot of like a release show. Like, you know, what do we do with this? We can't go on tour. Um, so she was really upset and she kind of sat with that for a little bit, but she had just raised a bunch of money um, on Kickstarter for her album. And so basically starting in March, she was going to be in the studio recording this album set to release in the fall. She had everything set up, super stoked about it. And um, that obviously got delayed because the yeah. first few months of quarantine, you know, she actually quarantined and wasn't able to get into the studio and couldn't really do things virtually she didn't have a good setup in her house, whatever. So she took what she had and she was like, you know what? My followers need to hear from me. I feel bad that my Kickstarter donors donated all this money and now this project is stalled. Like I need to provide them with some kind of value. Yeah. So what she ended up doing, she ended up releasing demo versions of the song, just like her singing to the track in her living room of the songs, not fully produced and being like, hey, this is where I'm at right now in the process. You guys want part of the production? Tell me what you think. Tell me what you think should be in here. Really engaged her fans. Um, and I thought that was really awesome. Um, yeah. I thought that was a really good way to keep people engaged. And she got some press off of it because Everyone was just like, how can I engage my audience during this time? And not just artists, you know, brands are looking for ways to do this too. So this really yeah. sparked inspiration for a lot of people. Her name is Kingsley, by the way. She's from Portland, Madrid. <laughs> I've heard of um, heard of her before. I don't know where though. But anyways. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> maybe from me, I talk about her often. Maybe, I yeah. Think I, I, said the, I think I said the same story during my, my interview with Ariel. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, Clearly, but yeah. I think it's... Really, like, I think it's a good tactic. <laughs> that is, that is. I mean, even even during a regular time, I think that would be a good idea. Like, even during like when life is back to normal and everything, and you're touring, um, if you have a project on the way, like fans, I think would love to be a part of it in some way if they could. And like hearing stuff along the way, that might be a way for an artist to have, <clears throat> like, a establish like a Patreon community or have kind of like an email list with that because. They don't have to make it public and not every fan's going to want it. But I think like hardcore fans are going to be into that stuff, you know? Yeah. I mean, you also just need to kind of put yourself in other people's shoes, right? Like, I don't know. Think about any artists that you listen to on the regular. You don't hear about them for a while. You start to wonder, hmm, let me think. Uh, when was the last time so-and-so put out something? I wonder what they're up to now. It would be nice to hear an update because... Yeah. The, the unfortunate truth is if you're not a super huge artist, the fans who listen to you regularly, if they don't hear from you, like they might start to not engage with you as much online or, you know, they might stop following you. Hopefully they don't, but they might <laughs> if you're not engaging with them enough. And the next time you put something out, they won't be there. But that is all part of the community building process, right? It's It goes for artists startups whatever you know if you're trying to build a community like you need to keep people engaged yeah so i guess that's a good segue into your all the community building stuff that that you do so you you offer kind of um at least i saw on your site kind of like consultation and and um you offer your expertise to help companies artists and anyone um build up their community so yeah is there, I, I think a good thing that people might be interested in on my channel is out of the artists that you've worked with, what's like the most common thing that you see artists lacking when it comes to them being able to build a community around their music? I think a lot of artists are scared to share or are scared that they're sharing too much. Um, but the truth is, especially now, you know, with so much going on in the world um, and in the country, I, I think a lot of people are scared to share their, their views and thoughts on stuff. Mm. Um, and the truth is that, that genuine, honest point of view that you're going to be posting on your social media, like people will appreciate that. Yeah. You know, don't do any of this uh, performative allyship as people are... <laughs> calling it um but you know be honest be honest and chances are if people are following you already they know who you are so yeah. you, you've got nothing to lose yeah i mean in terms of what you said about people being afraid to talk about that kind of stuff because of how the world is now um i, I tend to avoid all political stuff and on my channel even on like the community pages just because and i try to try to stay focused to what like my channel's about but on you know there was that one day where there was the blackout thursday or something um mm -hmm. and i was like okay i'll do i'll do one thing to, to show my support for this um and i just did like a youtube community post just talking about like kind of my my opinions of it and essentially everyone except for one person um <laughs> was like heck yeah great great job talking about that dude um and i think that that kind of, like, if you look at the news, it sounds like it's this hotly debated, div divisive topic, but, and I was kind of afraid that's what it would turn into, but I just did one post, and, like, I don't know, out of 30 comments, it was 29 out of 30 were like, hell yeah. And I think more artists should, um, even if it's not political, but be don't be afraid to share your opinion about, you know, whatever it is. I mean, and, and there's and there's so much right now, right? It doesn't, it doesn't, you don't have to make it political, but even within the music industry, there's so much happening. Like, what will the industry even look like in the future? <laughs> like, speak out about that. Like, yeah. what are you doing to kind of deal with this new life? You know, like, speak out about that because I think that, you know, if you're feeling it, chances are other people are feeling it too. Yeah. You know, you're not alone. You're definitely not alone. So why not 
share. Yeah, no, it's the same way with, with when I get questions from people. Um, I, I always assume I can make a video about that singular question because if one person's asking it, chances are there's like a couple hundred at least that, that have the same question. So I guess with the with um, any topic, you know, sharing your opinion about something or talking about the world, it would be the same way. You know, if, if you feel a certain way, chances are you're probably not a special snowflake, you know? It's, it's, mm -hmm. There's going to be a whole bunch more people who are who feel the exact same. Uh, so everyone in the chat, just uh, to let you know, feel free to get any questions you want in. At some point, I'll, I'll pick through some. Um, I see some some chat coming in, and someone made a funny comment when um, at the beginning when we talked about your uh, who the, if the guy that was uh, T Bone G was watching. Someone commented saying, <laughs> "My bad, it was me." <laughs> so uh, nice. I forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> nice, Oki. <okay>. Nice. <laughs> um, sweet. So you're uh, are you still involved in doing? In doing oh well i don't want to say involved in doing music but are you still releasing music or is your life kind of evolved into focusing more on helping others who do music oh, i don't <laughs> want to talk about it yeah. <laughs> no i'm just kidding i i unfortunately have not released music in quite some time i'm still co-writing um with a few different people um a couple artists in portland i uh, just started working with a girl here in miami um, and I, I love co-writes. I love co-writes, especially like I love just diving into a bunch of different genres. And I'm, I'm known as like the song editor. So people will just hand me like a bunch of lyrics um, and they'll show me the melody and they'll be like, here, do something with this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, great. I love this. I love this a lot. Um, so I've been doing a lot of that these days. I, I was just telling one of my friends, like I feel kind of stuck in my own writing though like releasing like mm. for me so actually in 2017 i actually put on my last show as ashley extina which was my stage name at the time and then somebody told me i had to change it because christina aguilera trademarked extina and she could sue me so what the heck that's weird <laughs> one it's interesting <laughs> like not that way so yeah. so in any case the next time i release something it likely won't be under that name um so i've just been having i think i'm having like a an artist identity crisis where i'm not sure like what i would want my new stage name to be or what kind of music i would even release because i'm i'm a different person now really i've grown into a different person um i have this dream of forming like a spanglish girl band <laughs> like a like a female mana or something like that <laughs> but um it hasn't hasn't come to fruition yet <laughs> yeah no, I, um, I i get that i mean I, I, it's hard figuring out like what kind of music you want to do and what because it's like it represents a lot you know like you don't want to be flip-flopping every release so you kind of have to premeditate to a degree what you want your sound to be and if you take a big break, like like you said, um, it's kind of like you have to make sure what you come back with is, is something that people want to hear. Otherwise, it's going to kind of flop. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know, at this point, like because I'm like com a community leader of sorts um, in the music industry and also in like the startup industry now, like I feel like a little bit of pressure too. like I'm not saying like I'm, I'm definitely in no way like very famous um but I feel like you know if I don't honor my Latina roots because I'm community leader of a Latina community that I would be shunned <laughs> <laughs> or people would be disappointed my mom's been waiting for me to rock out a Spanish album for a while now and I just have not done so Oh, yeah. <laughs> um so i'm just i'm i'm taking my time i'm trying not to beat myself up about it i i think that's that's probably like the best advice i can give anyone who's going through the same thing it's like I, we can't we can't really force creativity like that you know yeah and um i actually got some really great advice um that i will never forget from uh, a guy named kurt who was head of music something at mtv while i was interning there and I would send him, I would like show him my demos on occasion. I'd like go into his <laughs> office and be like, yeah, I wrote this song yesterday. What do you think? 
Um, and he was very nice. He would always listen to them and be like, that's great. Keep it up. I'm not sure if he actually thought they were great, but he was really <laughs> Uh, and he said to me, enjoy this time that you have now to really figure out your sound, figure out what you want to write about, because once you get signed or once you get your first placement or something like that, people will ex start expecting things from you. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't, it's not as fun that way <laughs> to start creating new content and, and you have to kind of like force yourself to, to write an album in a certain amount of time. So for anyone who's watching and they feel stuck um, and frustrated, enjoy this time um, because yeah. you can blow up tomorrow and you're going to feel a whole lot of pressure um, coming your way. Yeah. And, uh, and I totally agree. Just even with the, relatively small amount of success I've had with my music like I'm, I'm not like a big shot by any means but you know having having like 25,000 monthly listeners on Spotify makes me feel like well people are going to expect something out of my next song maybe like it's not a big deal if I s s change a little bit I don't have like a label hovering over my head or anything but there's still a pressure that I I say like I'm going to release a song every four to six weeks over this year I'm going to kind of stay in this realm of genres um, and it, it restricts your freedom. And in some ways, for me, that's that's funner and it's inspiring because it gives me a challenge and it kind of narrows the field a little bit. So instead of like having an ocean of possibility, you have like a path. Um, but it's fun in a different way. Like it's it's fun being able to just like mess around and experiment and figure out what you, what you want to do before you have any like definitive plan or path or, or pressure. So I, I see what you mean makes a lot of sense um alex botchel asks i missed the part of the video where you introduced her so ignore me if i'm asking a question she cannot answer but i'm curious <laughs> wh what percentage of income she sees artists reinvesting in their music oh uh that's a good <laughs> question that i would actually love to ask the woman crush music community um whenever we get <laughs> off this call <laughs> so i can get back to you with that information yeah um that, okay that's a that's a good question i'm i'm wondering why the question are they uh questioning how much to invest in their music career um i i know him so i i think yes um he's he's kind of a like up and coming electronic artist who has been getting into like using facebook ads to promote his music um so mm. i think he's wondering um you know, like as he starts to promote his music and get money back from it, you know, just how much should he anticipate saving and how much should he anticipate spending on future growth? Um, and I have my own answer to that, but I'd love to hear like your, your just opinion, I guess, on what, what you would say off the top of your head. I mean, I would say it just kind of depends on where you're at. Um, I am really all about generating a and cultivating an organic community um and i think that there are ways to do that it obviously takes time versus you know investing hundreds of dollars in advertisements uh, which then you risk kind of like having an inorganic community who might not stick around for very long um but i think it really depends on where you're at uh it, it's funny that you're asking that because uh even us as a as an organization, you know, we've been trying to figure that out ourselves, like for this virtual tour, um, trying to figure out how much it would be worth to invest in ads and things like that. And if they would actually be effective, because I'll be honest, and I've never run, run an ad before in my life. Okay. Um, so I am probably not the expert on this. <laughs> <laughs> probably not the expert. Um, but I, I do want to say that it, you definitely have to take a look at, at, at where you're at. I don't think yeah. you would want most of your beginning followers to come from ads. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a big proponent of using ads. I mean, I talk about ads a lot on my channel, but I'm also a big proponent of heavily utilizing social media and cranking out content around a release. Um, even if I'm not always the best example of it, um, I think every artist should have a, like, for example, like, 
daily Instagram content if they can, like try to put a bunch of TikTok content out, uh, try to put out YouTube videos behind the scenes, like get, get organic stuff as well as the ads. And before you even get into ads, I also think people should do the organic stuff first to like really figure out what their brand is and who their audience is. Um, yeah, because in, in those beginning phases, I feel like, uh, or at least for me, I can say as an artist, when I was just starting out, my like brand like developed quite a lot. Yeah. Um, and so I'm just, and like it changed quite a bit too. So I'm, I'm just thinking like if I had invested early on in a bunch of money on, on ads and, and that kind of stuff that maybe maybe it would have been uh, not the best use of my money. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there is, there is a big um, asterisk, you know, it depends on, on almost everything we're going to talk about just because everything's so custom tailored to the artist. But, um, you know, Alex, I, I think in terms of money you make, um, if I remember correctly, you, you work, you have like your, your income is stable, like aside from, from your music. So, I mean, that, that's the case I am in. So any money I make from any of my musical endeavors, I reinvest back into future growth, like a hundred percent, because I'm not relying on it to live. Um, mm -hmm. If I was, that'd be a different story, right? Cause I couldn't, I couldn't just say, well, I guess I'm not going to eat this month. You know, that wouldn't be an option. Um, so yeah, that, that'd be my answer based, based on how I know you. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So you you don't use any Facebook ads for for what you do at the moment. Nope. Nope. Have never run that. Actually, just yesterday, our COO was uh, <laughs> messaging me about getting into our ads manager on our Facebook account, and I was like, "How how do I even do that? <laughs> Facebook has changed so much since yeah. like I was like running a Facebook for other people. Um, so I." Yeah, I didn't even know how to get in there, which goes to show you how much of an ads expert I am. But perhaps I could, I could, you can direct me to uh, some of your ad episodes and I can learn something from you. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a probably like 20 or 30 tutorials on Facebook ads. But I mean, if, you know, you're, I, you guys are a non, a non-profit organization. So if, if you want help, like, you know, I'm, I, I can lend some assistance to you if you want. Um, We'll have to. Yeah, we, we can talk we about that. Definitely. Talk about that after the fact. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's cool. So it's actually even more impressive that you're you're building up with with Woman Crush. You're helping women uh, build up their their music business essentially just organically, like a hundred percent. I mean, maybe there's some PR that you're reaching out to, but it's without advertisement. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Yep. I have. I don't think I've ever once told somebody to run an ad, mainly because I wouldn't know how to tell them how to do it. But <laughs> you know, I I really, I guess because I come from a PR background, which you know traditionally that's not paid advertisements. Um, that's basically just crafting a really good story and running with it, and hoping that someone else finds it interesting. Um, and really fostering those connections for when you do have something to release. Um, I guess I just don't, I don't think that way. Um, and it comes yeah. into play with uh, community building too, or even for, for startups and people ask me about ads and like, I don't know, but I do know that you could attract more people if you start doing partnerships with like-minded organizations or you start hosting virtual events to get more people in the door or whatever it is. Right. Um, so that's just how I function, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So if, if an artist came to you and they weren't active on, let's say, anything online right now, like they're, they're just a talented artist with a great sound, they put out some songs and maybe they play a little bit locally um, and they're like, I can't build an audience, like I'm not online at all. Like what would you tell them to get into in terms of like social media platforms, like what would you tell them in terms of what types of content to post and like how regular to post? Like if with someone with zero like social media following whatsoever, where would you kind of push them to go towards? I would have a couple of questions for them before I can answer that. One, what kind of music do they play? I guess and I'll just, I'll use an, I'll, I'll, their shows. 
I'll, I'll pretend to be this artist and I'll answer as myself, I guess. <laughs> so okay. let's say uh, this will be a fun activity. Um, let's say it's, you know, I'm, I'm an electronic music artist doing uh, future bass type stuff. <laughs> okay. In terms of genres. What was your second question? And what kind of people usually show up for when you play shows? Uh, well, I don't do shows, but I'll pretend I do. Um, <laughs> I'd say um, like college age, like I'd, I'd say like a college crowd of, of electronic music fans who might be interested in fans of like Elenium and San Holo. Okay. So I would say if you're going to launch yourself into the uh, intriguing world of social media, I would probably start with Instagram I'm unsure about TikTok because I heard it might get banned here. So yeah. <laughs> I maybe wouldn't recommend that right now. Um, <laughs> but let's just go with Instagram. And I would say along with Instagram, maybe also try to start an email list. I, I mm. think maybe that's one thing that, that artists don't do. Um, and I still want to say that from what I remember when I was working like really into like, you know, coaching musicians and stuff like that is that email still sells more than social media does. Yeah. Um, hey, have you ever heard of Corinne Campbell? No. So she's the, um, she works at Entrepreneur, but she's, she hosts the Creative Juice podcast and she, she's a rock artist. Um, and not big on like platforms like Spotify, but she makes a full-time living off of her music from shows but also she says that like during the year between cycles and stuff her email list is what keeps her full time like she'll come up with merch send it to her list and make enough money to sustain her music endeavors and also like her her lifestyle just from her list yeah because think about it i i mean it really like everybody has email like maybe some people won't be on social media and that's yeah. kind of why I asked, like, what kind of music and what kind of people like come to your shows? Because you kind of want to figure out where your audience already is um, and just kind of start showing up there. Um, but I think about it like this, like, if you were like maybe like a punk artist or something like that, and you might have some like older um, or like a jazz artist you might have some older um, fans might not be on Instagram. Um, right. My dad's my dad's sixty something. He just started trying to use Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> not, not going well. Sorry, Dad. I know you're probably watching this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, or going to watch it. Um, but like, he just kind of like posts selfies all the time. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. Dad, no. But but he does know how to use Facebook quite well. And so you know, if that's your target audience right um then i would say maybe focus on facebook try to knock out one platform first um if you're like really really new um and then kind of see how it goes um and see how you can translate that kind of stuff into other ones but definitely like start with one and then also add email email is very very important and there are ways that you can you know lead people from your social media platform to the email list and funnel them into yeah. there. And there are things that you can offer them, you know, to sign up and things like that. Yeah, and that's something I've never talked about on, on my channel, like using, uh, you know, I talk a lot about ads, but even just unrelated to that, there's a concept of a lead magnet, which is what you just, you brought up, which is, you know, your every email is a, a lead and uh, a lead magnet is something that pulls in those leads. So you might, you might do an Instagram post or something um, or stories post saying like, hey, click the link in my bio to sign up for my email list. And I'm going to pick um, five people to win a free T-shirt or I'm going to give you a free download of my new song or I'm going to give you early access in this behind the scenes, um, like a 30 minute documentary I made of how I was producing the song, you know, whatever it is. Um, but it's powerful. Like if, if you have people that are genuinely interested, a lot of people will sign up for your email list to get that. Yeah, and honestly, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot happening on social media right now um, with everyone being home and being bored, not really anything to do that 
I get really excited when I get emails from artists versus, you know, oh, they just posted something again. I mean, it's still exciting, but like not as thrilling as like an artist email because <laughs> I don't I don't get a lot of those. Yeah. Um, especially if it's just like a hey, this is what I'm working on kind of thing. <laughs> not pushing right. any kind of release um, or anything. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm into it. Nice. So I, you mentioned earlier that you've been involved in sync placements or, or trying to help artists get sync placements. And I know there's been a couple of times where I've had guests on or done a live stream. People have asked me about that and I don't know a damn thing about getting sync placements. So <laughs> I, I would I would love I think the question that's come up uh, to to me and a couple guests has been, do you have any advice for an artist who wants to get into sync placements? How would they start getting their first few um I guess sinks. <laughs> so I am definitely not a sync expert, but uh, we definitely did recently have a webinar with a woman named Shannon, who is the um, head of artist relations. I think it's her title at Pink Music, which is a a woman founded sync licensing company in LA. Um, and what she said to that was, "There's." <laughs> It depends. (laughs) (laughs) It's always that it depends. Um, Her words, not mine. Um, But she said it depends. But also, you know, just start making those relationships with people that work for these um, agencies. I've found LinkedIn to be super helpful. Um, Hmm. I've never used LinkedIn before, like a few months ago. And I'm really into it now, like so into it that I paid for premium. Um, oh wow! <laughs> very helpful <laughs> in yeah. all areas of business, um, but um, there's there you know there's not only these companies right like you can reach out to music supervisors and see like oh what are you working on like what kind of music do you think that you'll need for this oh can I send you something um, just for feedback things like that and there's also all these music libraries that you can submit your songs to which like. Right. It's not as uh, exclusive as being signed to a sync company like Think Music, which is an exclusive, like they give you an exclusive contract. Um, And they, if I were releasing music, I would want to work with someone like them because it's kind of like a little family, right? They only take on a certain amount of artists and they're just focused on pitching these these artists and they take your whole catalog, not just by song, which is what most libraries do, um, from what I understand. So... Um, yeah, it's pretty neat. So looking into small companies like that, um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure now, um, you know, TV and film stuff are starting to shoot again. Um, hmm. So there's going to be probably a pretty pri- a big need for uh, a tank music soon. Interesting. Yeah, I've mm-hmm. I've I like very casually looked into how that all works at one point. Like I, I made a song trader account which is kind of like I was uh, one of those platforms, like they don't like license your music and then pitch it. It's kind of like some um, film people or people who make commercials will put like an ad and then you can pitch mm-hmm. to that ad that they have. Yeah. So they'll say like, the we need- Taxi, Taxi is another one of those. Yeah, I've, I've heard very mixed things about Taxi. Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Like I think they, they cost a couple hundred dollars to be, be in their membership and then they take a cut and people are wondering if it ever if they ever get deals from it or not but some people say that they make a lot of money from it so i guess take that for what it's worth everyone (laughs) it depends yeah it's almost everything (laughs) in this is like that's why a lot of like actual pr companies and actual music marketing companies will very rarely ever say like we charge this much money for a pr campaign because it's completely customized for every artist. Like they might be in the ballpark, they could give a rough number, but you know, if if you went to them and you said, "Hey, I'm releasing a song next month, but you haven't put out stuff in a couple of years," it's going to be completely different than like an artist who's cranked out a song every four weeks and is a completely different genre that you're in. Like completely different. They might have to rehaul one person's whole story and strategy, while another person might already have a very solid strategy and story. Well, it also, it also depends. <laughs> it depends a lot on what the 
um, what the people you're pitching to um, are going through with their um, blog or, or publication or whatever you want to call it or podcast. Um, it, mm. it really depends on what they're going through too, because I could, you know, let's say I signed on to be your publicist, right? And I'm pitching my best friend who, you know, let's say she works for Billboard or something like that. I'm like, hey, like, you got to listen to this guy. He's real talented. He writes about this, this, and this. He's done this, this, and this. He has X amount of followers on his YouTube channel. Like, he's really great. Check him out. He's got this new thing coming out, super relevant to what's going on in the world. Like, let me know what you think. And then she goes, yeah, uh, even if she's my best friend, like we're not paying for placement. So one, yeah. she might not like you even if I love you. <laughs> Two, maybe they're not focusing on new releases right now and they're just doing, uh, you know, I don't know, I'm totally making this up. Maybe they're just doing like Kickstarter features or something like that. Um, or, I, I mean, I can tell you from because Woman Crush Music has a blog too, and I, I get pitched stuff all the time. Um, and now we have an editorial coordinator who goes through that stuff. But when I was going through the pitches, um, when COVID first hit, like we really wanted to focus on artists who were releasing things creatively mm. um, during COVID, just like that. I just released a song last Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and like, because we are such a small team and only have a certain amount of writers, um, we have to be a little bit picky about what we put up and so we can only focus on on one thing at a time um and so you know it, you might be a great artist but we just don't have the capability right now and, and i think right now that's what's happening um with a lot of pitches too is that unfortunately a lot of media outlets have had to let their staff go um yeah. there is a lot of writers who aren't writing anymore so if you're pitching something right now um it, it happened to me this morning. I was pitching the press release about the Woman Crush tour, and I got a lot of, I got furloughed. Um, you know, I, uh, mm. I'm on vacation indefinitely. <laughs> <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> um, so it's it's the unfortunate truth of, of what's happening right now. Um, so it depends yeah. on, on a lot of different things. Yeah, and that, that subjectivity aspect of it is, is very important. Like a lot of artists that get rejected might f f from anything, whether it be PR or placement. Like what, I, I, mean, I do some I do music creation on some MidHub and a couple other places. Um, so people pitch me their music on there. And the most common reason I reject stuff isn't because it's not good. It's just not the best fit or it's not my style. And, you know, as you said with Woman Crush, like one time you might be featuring, you know, artists that, are doing unique things in the current world climate for releasing their music. And then your your friend that you would pitched up to might just not be into that style of music in the first place, or maybe they're focusing on something like niche at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, that's, that's the same thing. Like maybe I just approved 10 future based songs and I don't want to like completely bombard my future based playlist with more few, more like smaller artists. I want to have a balance between different size artists. So, um, a lot of artists, they'll say, I'm not happy with, with how this is going. And I, they get super like, they take it super personally, but you kind of have to take all that stuff with a grain of salt when you get rejected, like develop a, a turtle shell, I guess. Um, it's a lot, it's a lot of subjectivity. I mean, it's music. It's like the most subjective thing in the world. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. So one thing, let me read through this. Hold on. Oh, I thought I saw a question. Um, never mind, I won't read that one. Um, so one thing I wanted to talk about <laughs> is we, I mentioned this in my email, is um, we already talked about how you started Woman Crush, the history of it. But uh, one thing that I thought would be interesting to dive into is why, why the... Why do you think it's necessary to have have an, a specific, like, woman-focused um, kind of music thing? I mean, I get it, but just for people watching, um, you know, the, the music industry is kind of a giant sausage fest in a way, right? It, when I look at my YouTube analytics, it's 96% male, <laughs> which is, like, ins 
it's nuts to me that it's it's that it's that much of a divide. But then when I went to Nam this year, I was looking around. It's like again, it's just kind of like a big dude fest. So, uh, what's what's your opinion behind like why that is and and like what what can we do about it? Is it like a problem? And uh, I guess just dive into that can of worms. <laughs> um. Are you sure you want to do this, Andrew? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think it'd be a good thing to talk about. Like, wh- why is? I mean, I don't, I don't want to turn it into like, um, you know, people in the chat getting getting feisty with anything if if they're going to. But I think it'd be a good thing to talk about. Like, why is why is the music industry so like male dominated at the moment? Um, well, the truth is, I don't think it's just it's it's not just the music industry, um, which, you know, I am now learning that I've been uh, kind of getting into the tech industry a little bit more with the startups that I consult for. Um, it's a lot of dudes. It's a lot of dudes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and that's fine. Um, you know, as long as they are able to see us as equals and respect what we're doing um, and not question that we know how to do our job just because we're women yeah um and unfortunately that happens um i've had personally i can tell you i had some not great experiences um while i was still in school in new york uh there was a situation where uh my band played my all-girl rock band at the time all-girl rock trio we played a very well-known venue in the city i'm not going to put them on the spot Um, but we worked with a certain promoter and he didn't want to pay us up front because he didn't think that an all-girl rock trio could sell out a show oh yeah that's that's bad yeah that's bad <laughs> yeah yeah um and guess what we did actually sell out the oh, show. Cool. He, still, he still didn't want to pay us though so that was super fun to navigate and i was very young still so i didn't really know how to advocate for myself and you know after after a few different experiences when you start getting treated like like that you start to get used to it and if you're young especially like i was i I kind of started to think that it was normal, you know, and that it was okay. Um, and that's, I think that's really one of the reasons what prompted me to, to start this just like community of women supporting each other so that we can share this information with each other and share like safe, call them safe places to play um or you know safe safe producers i i I hate that i have to even say that and you can definitely ask what i mean by safe. Uh, no i I think i get it when you hear like what happened sound guys not going to (laughs) yeah yeah i mean like with with, the sound guys going to hit on us things like that (laughs) like the the kesha story right that's when that came out like i don't know if it's a producer or, or what but i i get what you mean by by safe producer and i mean if anyone's wondering you can just google kesha and you'll find that whole thing yeah and if you give me a minute i have a, if you really want to get into this i have some uh statistics in our uh sponsorship deck actually yeah. um i think i think you're you're like the best person to talk about about this issue <laughs> considering you you founded woman crush you know <laughs> awesome. Well, give me a moment. I can find it because unfortunately, I do not have uh, do not have the statistics memorized. Although I probably should. <laughs> Damn it, Ashley! You're supposed to have it memorized. <laughs> I know, right? That's wrong. With me. <laughs> yeah. But in the meantime, I can I can tell you my fun producer story, which I don't tell often, um, just because it's like a little bit triggering, but I'm happy to tell it now while we wait for me to find these statistics. Yeah, so, go for it. Uh, while I was um, working at this jazz club that I mentioned earlier, I met a lot of interesting people. Um, it was a really great experience. And I also was not shy about telling people that I was an aspiring artist. Um, So we had some big timey producers walk in and out and they were friendly with me because I was like the maitre d. So I would welcome everyone and everyone who was a regular knew who I was. 
um, and things like that. So there was this one day where I was like getting ready to release my first song, I think. And, um, and <laughs> I'm laughing because it's just, it's really like not great. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, uh, I mentioned something to him like, oh, like, can I send you like the song that I'm, I'm planning on recording and releasing it's my first big project. Like, I would love your feedback on it because, you know, you've done all these great things. And uh, he was like, actually, um, do you want to come to my studio uh, and like hang out and you can play it for me there? He was much, much older than me, by the way. So I didn't think anything of it. Um, and I was like, sure. Yeah, I was like super pumped for it. I was so ready to like to become famous because the big time producer was like really into my music and believed in me and this, this and that. I'm sure I don't have to go very farther with the story. Um, yeah. He did not invite me over to his home studio to talk about my music. Right. Um, to make it worse, actually, I was underage and he took me to a bar. <laughs> oh. So he, yeah. he sounds like a great dude. Sarcastic great yeah. dude. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, I do forgive the uh, guy who T-boned me, but not so much this producer guy. I hope he's listening. I hope he's ashamed of himself. <laughs> yeah, so he should be. Should be. I mean, that's that's awful between uh between all of these experiences and there's more um i aside from really wanting a community of like-minded people um i really wanted to protect other women in the industry from going through something like this and i know mm. that's like pretty impossible <laughs> to be able to protect everyone um but you know, we are we are trying to share these yeah. resources. Anyway, I found the statistics oh, cool. <laughs> of the sponsorship deck um, to be able, and the the title is "Why We Matter." <laughs> um, so, of 700 songs on Billboard's year-end Hot 100 chart between 2012 and 2018, women make up. 21.7% artists, 12.3% songwriters, and 2.1% producers. Two? Of, you say 2.1%? Yeah, wow. 2.1%. Of 75 female songwriters and producers interviewed, 40% recall being dismissed or discounted by colleagues. Of Grammy nominees between 2013 and 2019, only 10.4% were women. Now, I also have statistics from 2019 of the different percentage of female acts signed to major labels. Atlantic Records, 31%, Def Jam, 21%, Republic, 28%, Interscope, 28%, UMG, 30%, Epitaph, 9%. Mm. Um, I think Epita some... Epitaph's the metal label. Is that who they are? Yeah. Um, so just some... Uh, statistics not just experience yeah, um, yeah. for everyone watching uh do you happen to know what's what's the average like overall like ratio between men and women and in, in, like out of artists is that a number that even is calculated anywhere out of out of like in total just like, just, like any like, artist pursuing general? music yeah no i'm not sure i'm not sure anyone's ever counted yeah that much so I think in like my, my circle of friends, um, I know I know one woman who does music and it's more of like a for fun casual thing. And I know like nine nine dudes who are who are into it. So it's I wonder uh, I wonder if it's just because like me and like my friend circle and like, you know, naturally guys tend to have more guy friends and ladies tend to have more lady friends. Maybe that's part of it. And that's the reason why I don't know as many people, but um, that's crazy that it's like not like nine percent in some cases. And like two percent producers, that's yeah. the weirdest part. Yeah. Jeez. Um, I mean, I I can't even even though I founded Woman Crush Music and I work with a lot of women songwriters, I don't think I can count that I know five female producers on my hand, like off the top of my head. I can't. I only know uh, Courtney Hawkins on YouTube. Mm. Um, she she does like music production content and on Instagram too, but. Um, 
I don't think I know. There's a few other that Andrew Wong has had on this channel, but I don't know them mm -hmm. off the top of my head. And I don't know any personally. So that's, <laughs> that's the other thing. Yeah. But I mean, you asked like what you can do to help. And I, I think, uh, even if you don't have a big platform, you know, like if you're a dude and you're watching this and you're like, Oh my gosh, I'm just realizing this is a huge problem. Like, what can I do? Um, you can go through the Woman Crush Music website, find some awesome songwriters to co-write with and promote the crap out of them. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. thank you, Andrew, for, for having me on your on your show because this is, this is help. <laughs> this is yeah. helping. Good. I'm this glad. <laughs> having more women on, on your platform, you know, whether you have a big or small one, um, that, that helps. Um, and if you can yeah. keep it diverse, uh, that's also great and important too. Yeah. And I, I think it's, it's good. Like in general with everything in life, my perspective is like everything in life should be an equal playing field for everyone involved. Like, obviously there's going to be natural, like based on the population, like there's going to be like, there's going to be, I don't know how, like what percentage of America is, is black versus Latino versus what there's going to be different spread, but it should always be a fair playing field. There shouldn't be any kind of like discrimination for, for politics or for music or for video games. Like it should all be kind of a even thing. Um, and that's a good point that like, even if you don't have a, a platform, um, like mine or, or even, even, you know, like Andrew Wong or something, um, you can still do stuff by collaborating with certain, certain people. And like, I, I'm not going to say like, go out and, um, like work with someone who you're not interested, like working with, but I'm sh like, if you go to, to your site, I don't know how, how extensive, like your list of list of artists is, but I'm sure there's a, awesome singers on there that you would love to work with. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just go through our blog. We put up a lot of new releases and interviews. There was just a, a ladybug festival filled with all women artists. Um, we did some interviews on the blog um, from the festival performers. So start there if you need mm. a starting point. Yeah, yeah. Not understand. Henry has an Instagram. Henry hates everybody. <laughs> if you guys want to follow him, also follow at Woman Crush Music. Thank you. <laughs> 